Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Rizzoli Bookstore. Uh, my name is Jessica Knapp. I'm the Associate Director of Publicity here at Rizzoli, and we're thrilled to have you here tonight to celebrate the publication of Finding Home. Architectural firm, Pursley Dixon. Sorry, Pursley Dixon. You can tell them I'm rusty on the microphone these days. Uh, they are the recipients of the Veranda ADAC Architecture Firm of the Year Award and the Southern Living Home of the Year Award. And tonight we have the honor of having Principal Ken Pursley in conversation with Jackie Terrebone, editor in chief of Gallery Magazine and a dear friend of the House of Rizzoli. So we're going to have great chat. We've got our slideshow going in the background. At the end, we'll take some Q and A's. And then when we're done with that, I uh, will turn it over to the book signing portion of the evening. You can purchase books at the front register and then come back in to have them signed at the table over here. And if my information is correct, Ken will be signing with Craig Dixon as well this evening. Is that correct? Excellent. So thank you all for coming. And Jackie and Ken, take it away. As part of that story, there were really two sounds that came up, and one was the sound of the crickets, 
in what was the sound of the cars. And as this sort of analogous thing to our work, and you realize like the cars would sort of quietly crescendo and go away. Um, and those really were sort of the trends that you can see within design and architecture. But I think it's important that there's this sort of other subtle sound you hear of crickets, which is much more musical and melodic and understated. And to me, that's those you know, spaces that feel good about what they look like. You know, kind of make the argument in the book that that's sort of the emotional connection that underlies good architecture, and that's the piece that actually makes it last over time. That that's, that's the part that really matters, and that's what we're trying to do with the work. So, so what's an example of that that you may see in the book, like that's been one of your favorite projects? Well, I mean, like one thing I've used before is when I was a you know, young child, when I was in my bedroom, it was on the second floor, and it had this dormer space, and I decided at some point, like, oh, I'd rather sleep in the dormer than sleep in my bed. And so I made a pallet, and it had walls on it, and had a view out. And it just it felt cozy, it felt comfortable, I loved how I could sort of connect with the outdoors. And so within houses, we've done this thing called the sleepy dormer. And it might be wooden and it might have a place to put your cell phone, but the emotional connection is still the same. The way that it feels, it takes a space that is different, that feels right, even though it looks differently. And, and that gets to that deeper layer of a feeling over surface. And that's, you know. Yeah, what I think we're trying to do. So when you built this palette, you were kind of saying, oh, this guy's going to be an architect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was like a screen that turned on the light switch. Yeah. I, I don't think they knew what to do with it. So it was just like, yeah, it's like the thing. Gave him lots of Legos. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, and if you had to, you know, you touched on this a little bit before, but I think a lot of times people want to pigeonhole the architects into like, you're this type, you're a classicist, you're a modernist. What, you know, what's the style of the firm? Or how do you explain to people that you're not just one thing? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've been thinking about this, this whole term, transitional, and you've heard this in interior design. And it's, it's, it's a term I don't really like. And I'm like, it's almost like, you know, somebody traditional is morphing into somebody modern. And halfway between the morphosis, they take a picture and they go, you're transitional. And, and I think what's really happening right now, and I, and I you know, credit you know, Bobby McAlpin that I've worked for and studied, that there's not this sort of us against them mentality of, of more traditional or classical design versus modern design. And so I've equated it on a really deep intellectual level to, to Lego boxes. <laughs> and so there's sort of the modernist Lego box that I think has planes of glass and flat ceilings and open connection. And then there's the traditional box that has more it's roofs and buttoned windows and you know, more of a study of proportion. And I think what we're doing, a lot of our architecture firms are doing, we're dumping the boxes together. And we're saying, you know what, why are we pigeonholing ourselves from a, a pallet of materials to work with? Why don't we mix these two together? And I really think what that does, it gives you a lot of um, stylistic freedom to take those pieces and then you can express yourself whatever way you want to. You've got more words to use because you're not limiting yourself. And that, I'm going to throw you a curveball. It's not one of the questions we discussed before. I like, it. I like but it. that makes me think a lot of, of how we discuss materiality and how important that is to projects and making them seem a part of where they're from, where they live, where these houses are. Can you tell us a little bit about how you come up with what you're going to build the houses of to make them feel one with where they are? Yeah, I, mean, I kind of put that into the a little bit of the skin category. You know, if houses have bones, if houses have skin. And I think that, you know, like the corral board that we used on the house out west is something that they would use to block snow drifts, and it gives it this sense of, of place. You know, it gives it this sense of feeling. And I, you know, I think my main goal is just having some level of authenticity yeah. in the materials and how you're using them. Um, but also, I think you use it for that's the music of the house. And so if you want a low ceiling to feel lower, you might use a darker material or more textured material. Um, if you want a high ceiling to feel higher, you might use lighter materials. And so I think mean, there's also that kind of dynamic. Or we've got a house on the side of a hill that we wanted to really play up, you know, this sort of cabling feeling. Before we were into before you're released out into the view, so stone so natural material to use in that case. And so um, you know, I think you, you, you strip the story and you use the materials to reinforce what you're trying to do with the story. And I love um, the story we talked about with 
the board, they found that like a bourbon distillery or something like old weather board, that that was just what you needed for something. Yeah. And all the fancy materials. Well, well, and even that, it was called bourbon boards. They were trying to sell these oak barrels. That, that's actually where we found some great stone that were from a distillery they were taking part that was all blackened from charred barrels when we flipped it over it had this beautiful like buff colored limestone and i'm like what are you doing with that and they're like i don't know this is just old black well, i'm like it's beautiful that's what you need to be selling because one of, <laughs> one of the houses we get from you know almost the most falls of is made out of that material which is you know just it's 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 stone without being repressive mm -hmm. and so that's again there's a there's a emotional component to what you're trying to do with materials I like that, and the bourbon leads us also to, I mean, we had so many wonderful calls. I think about when you were having a glass of bourbon, and I was probably having a glass of rosé, and you're sitting outside, I could hear the crickets in your backyard, very different from my life in New York. But um, we talked a lot about, you know, Southern architecture. What does that mean? Does that define you? Is that a part of who you are? But how is that a part of what the concept of the firm is as well? Well, it's been interesting. I think as we've um, had more sort of nat national exposure, and we've you know, had more jobs in the Northeast or out West or in the Midwest, you sort of see your southernness reflected against that. So I don't think you know how southern you are until you are with somebody who's not southern. And I, and I do what? Like, what accent? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, but I think what's what's what I, what I found interesting about the firm is I do think Southerners in general are very polite people, and I think our architecture, you know, even if it's going to sort of push some boundaries, it generally has sort of a polite disposition to it, and I think the boundaries we push tend to be a little more um, internalized or behind the, the facade, as we talked about, and to me that's something I've realized in Southern culture that I sort of relate to what we do is I think Southerners are always polite, but you don't always quite know where they stand until you're invited into a sort of deeper layer. And you know, and I think our, our work is is that way too. I think you know, I think we feel like we want to be a good neighbor. We don't want to upset people, but yet we still do have these sort of secret passageways and hidden things and you know eccentricities that exist below the surface. And that to me that makes people and buildings rich. And I love that about, I mean, I think there are several houses that are such great examples of that, where you're driving up to, like, what a respectable house. And you walk in, and there's something cooler, much cooler happening inside. And you see, like, oh, this isn't a grand, older family. This is, like, a young, vibrant family that lives here. Or you give them enough that you think, that's interesting, but something's going on there. Like, I, I, you know, I tend to like people that are that way when you meet somebody that you know you think they're interesting there's more to them and then as you get to know them there's a deeper richer relationship that unfolds and i think i like architecture that way so it's not all spent in the facade and foyer that right. as you get to know the house and you live with it you start to realize oh gosh i love this room or i love this connection or i, I never went into this space of how i love what this feels and that you know that, that gives you a relationship with the house instead of just visiting a house or being wowed by a house or you know frankly watching a, a magic trick when you go oh, well, that was fun <laughs> now what <laughs> yeah. um so there's the architect and there's the house but there's another element there and it's the client so how do you work with your clients to sort of tease out what they're looking for meld everything together and bring forth what's right for them yeah it's it, <sighs> It's interesting because I, I, we touch on this within the firm that you know I don't want our work to be about our great ideas and and we're like gosh if you'll just take this idea and run with this that this is going to make us happy but I really see the client sort of folding into that conversation that we have and, and you know, we use this analogy a lot about a dinner party in that you know the expectation really even to your designers landscape architects homeowners is I want this balance of conversation that everybody contributes to it but doesn't dominate the table and so i think if you get a client that says you know tell me what to think i think that can have a set of challenges or if you get a client that says i know better than you do that has a set of challenges and so what i always enjoy is this coming together 
with other people and in this sort of balance of the conversation, and what I find is the space between everybody generates something that's unique to those people coming together at that point in time. And personally, I get a richness out of that experience. And I think you know a good a good client understands that balance. Um, and I think they get something more special because of that. So it's um, you know I think they're the differentiating factor a lot of times that makes the house unique to them. Um, but there's still a lot of us in it as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. So I feel like the house is almost like a personality test sometimes. It's like a Rorschach. How do you like figure out what they really need or who they really are and bring that forth? Well, I mean, in the, in the book, there's a, um, a, it's a, it's called a triple self-portrait, but it's a um, Norman Rockwell painting that has him you know, kind of in front of with glasses doing a self-portrait, and a self-portrait, he's got a, a, a pipe, and you know, there's this seven year kind of look, and, and as I thought about the book and thought about what we're doing, it really is a series of portraits. And so I do think we're the interpreter of people, but we are painting a version of the client that are better than they probably really are, and I think it should be, you know, rather than saying this is exactly who you are. And so I think that interpretation, if you do it in a way that says, what are you about and what what's the best dress for you versus saying, you know, I think I know better than you do, this is what you're gonna wear. If that makes sense. So I so I do like this to you know to frankly to listen um, and absorb that information and I love that interpreting somebody back to themselves but with the mindset that it's it is their house. Um, and I, I think that keeps it interesting and keeps it unique. And we, when we started talking about your we started on the chapters about in the mountains, and that was right at the beginning of lockdown, and you know, couldn't leave my block in New York City. And looking at them gave me such a feeling of escape and this imagination, and like you could smell the air and feel it just looking at the photos. And how do you bring that out in houses? Because it's really, I mean, it's transformative. And I was just looking at a, a Zoom screen, so to be inside them, I couldn't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the more dramatic the site, and I think mountain houses fall in that category, the architecture you know, really becomes the, the, the arbiter between the person using it and the environment. And at a base level, you're like, don't screw it up. So don't let the house get in the way of it. And I think at its best, I think it amplifies it. And so I do think you can look at the site lines, look at the porches, look at the way the sun comes in. So the architecture is really in my mind, going between those two things, which is the person using it and the experience you're trying to give them. And when you have a dramatic site like that, I think the opportunity is great just to amplify that whole connection. And um, you know, mixed with also, I think, where we are in, in the engineering of architecture right now, we can do 30 foot sliding walls that open up, we can do screens that roll down. There's just things that you can physically do with a house now that we couldn't do 20 years ago. And that makes you make things your connect. And I feel like there's sort of you, you definitely mastered porches um, with your houses. They're incredible and they just kind of catapult you outside into nature. How, what are some of your tricks on how you make that happen? Well, a couple of things. One is I don't like porches that block views. And so the idea of like, here's my living room, and here's a porch off of it, and you're looking through your furniture going out to the view, it just immediately kills the connection between the inside and the outside. And so I generally put them adjacent, but I also like porches that are room proportioned so that you can furnish them and you can have conversation pieces and, you know, versus a linear porch of rocking chairs lined up looking out. Um, and that also crack, you know, catches the cross ventilation. I think stepping them up and down for sight lines, it's really important to see a lot of our projects will go down three steps to the porch so it lowers the furniture so your aperture out doesn't get blocked. Um, and that's, you know, again, that's manipulating the architecture to not get in the way of the experience of the person inside. And I love that dining setup that you have outside of one that just like cantilevered off the side, like it just looks like it's flying off the side of a mountain. Yeah. I mean, the architecture is literally reaching out with its arms, and then we did engineer it in a way that it has no corner posts, and so there's nothing to block your view, so you get that panoramic view, because that's that emotional piece that 
gives you that draw and gives you that you know, excitement of being in the mountains. And is it the same house or a new one that has the little upstairs? That was the same house. And that's what I find with all these houses is they, you know, they're basically a story. And that house, we presented to the client said, this is great. And the client says, um, you know, this is great, but I'd love to be on the top of the, the view, the top of the ridge. And I'm like, okay, we could probably do that. And so we did this Harry Potter stair that comes up into the roof. And I said, well, if we do it, though, you know, I don't want some little cupola to go up in the cocktail wines and you stand there. So we actually did a porch and we were off the ridge of the roof that looks out into, you know, this is the National Forest that, you know, was, was every time that happens or the client that says, I want another dormer or I want a little twist, I find that just makes the story that much richer, makes the house that much more interesting to have those little pieces of unexpected things. So what are some of your other favorite ones that you've done? Well, the, um, the, that? Dave's parents' house is one of my favorite houses. And so her dad was like, you know, he might just be in, you know, the chief state. I don't know. He was like, can we go to another room? Can we go to the <laughs> and so he did this dormer off the front of the roof. And it's like a lot of people's favorite place to sleep because you are nestled next to the light. You get up in the window. You can hear the waterfall. Um, it just feels good. And it's, it's not, you know, your conventional bedroom with a bed wall. And it's just tucked away. You know? There's just a richness to those kinds of spaces. Yeah, and in the house out west, I love the Harry Potter, also like sort of bookcase. Yeah. That well, and we'll use hidden doors and secret discoveries sometimes, you know, for whimsy and playfulness, but sometimes it also, if there's two people there or there's two couples there, and it's a five or six bedroom house, you can also use it to make the house feel smaller. Because I think that's a way to sort of take away a lot of the architecture visually and say, let's just live in this part and I don't have to think about the rest of the house. So it's really almost a scaling device. So that when it's like a bookshelf that makes a wall. Mm -hmm. So when it's closed, you would think this is the end of the house. And until you push it open, you don't know it's there. I feel like I have a lot of drinks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes just don't push the door. <laughs> to do with, and as much as I appreciate classical architecture, I think a lot of times it is sort of designed from the outside in. You know? And there's one renovation we did in particular that was on nine acres, it lifted upon, but it had a two-story porch on the front, and it had no windows looking out to the pond. And I thought, you know, it, it looked stately, and it was beautiful and appropriate for the setting, but you thought, I'm inside this house, I can't see the water. So just as a basic human, Connection, I thought. And actually, it scrolls up. I'll, I'll show you the front. Well, if I can catch it, it goes through. That, that's the porch in the columns. But, but it scrolls up. So, so we basically took it and added. You keep uh, talking. I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. We added a huge bay window on the front because then you could live inside of it and we moved the porch adjacent to it, and which frankly was more comfortable. So you weren't up on this pedestal being looked at. So the whole psychology of the house switched is it was being designed from the inside, looking back out. And in that sense, it lived well. And I think without that, like it just, I, sometimes when I got too practical and I look at a house and think, that's not the room I want to be in, or why can't I see the water? And with renovations, I walk into somebody's house, and I'm like, you have a beautiful backyard. I can't see it. And they go, huh, never thought about that. I'm like, yeah, like, whatever you do, you need to achieve this. Like, it's, it's important. Just passed when we talked before. Yeah. I feel like I keep looking at I think it's in the slideshow, but we'll, we'll see if it comes up again. Oh, yeah. I love that. It's so beautiful. That so, anyway, so a lot of that's just you know, designing for the inside. Is it? Yeah, this is it. Yeah, so that's that's the bay window we had over the front and the porch to the left. And, and there's a closer view. Somewhere else. But, yeah. And um, as you can see in the slideshow, too, like a lot of these are quite large homes. And how do you? bring that soulfulness to them? How do you make them feel like home and that inside you're cozy aside from shelves that swing open and make you feel more positive? What are 
what are sort of some of the techniques, some of the things that you like to write? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times we'll you know break the house down into several pretty things that happen to be connected, and so rather than think that of it as one big box, we'll we'll design the spaces so that there's an unfolding or a layering to it. Because I think there's house as facade, and then there's house as experience. And I think when you think of it more like a series of experiences, you can really play down the additional experiences even in a big house. So there is more of like an unfolding that. Um, the other thing we'll do is we'll put, create spaces within spaces. And so not every space has to be grand. I mean, I think it's okay to have a low space next to a grand space. And so we talk a lot about how it's being like useful notes that are taking you through. And so I think you have those big moments, but they only work if you have the smaller moments before. So there is a, there, there is a choreography that happens within it. And so I, you know, I think a lot of what we do is manage the bigness to try to make it not feel big because, you know, personally, I don't really like big, obnoxious houses. <laughs> so <laughs> you work hard to try to not do that, but. Exactly. And um, speaking of big, obnoxious houses, um, tell us about where you live. No. Oh, it's big, obnoxious. <laughs> I think um, people are so fascinated, and rightfully so, with how architects live at home. It's your laboratory, how you're thinking. Tell us about where you live and how you live and what it's taught you? Well, and I'm just an architecture junkie, and so I just I love houses, I love visiting them, but I don't really have preconceptions about what I want to visit or what I want to see, and so when we were looking for a new house, we lived in two colonial houses that were, you know, chambered rooms and dining room left, living room right, right, and they were fun and they didn't get in the way, but they didn't, as I wrote about in the brand article that um, had come out, and, and also in the book, is that it didn't really teach anything. It wasn't, it felt like a one-sided conversation. And so we found this great mid-century modern house, and I don't really consider myself a modernist, but I just loved the spaces and the heights and, you know, these sort of underlying bone structure of the, the house and even the orientation of the light. And so I thought, wow, there are so many lessons here that I could apply, not in an aesthetic sense, but more in an emotional sense. And so I've loved living in this house it was designed in 1952 it's called you know, it's a massive solar design it's kind of the international style but it's just good architecture and so as an architect linking to the past i learned i love learning this architect who's long gone who's still teaching me these lessons um, as an architect about light and overhangs and orientation and um and I, you know, and, I, and I wrestled with, because I'm also really involved in preservation, about what you keep and what you change. And I think we try to strike that balance, because it did still have a kitchen that was chambered, and our old houses were that way, so I wanted a kitchen that would you know, connect. And so as a laboratory, I think it struck that balance of me feeling like I've contributed to it, but I haven't undone what was great about it. So for me, it's been a, it's been a great experience. And um, more difficult than designing all of these houses and having this beautiful portfolio and um, putting together this fantastic book is probably coming up with a title for the book. So how did you come up with a title and, and what does finding home mean to you? Well, originally, I think it was this gracious southern home, I think is where we started. <laughs> Even though I was like, no, I don't know they southern. So then it was the gracious home. Um, yeah, it's uh, Sarah, my wife, actually came up with the title. It was, um, nice work, it was, Sarah. A, it was a, a podcast that we, um, it just kind of resonated. I mean, I think, you know, titles are funny. I mean, I, it's, you Google what else is out there, you try to find, and then there's the marketing piece about having the word home in it. And, um, but it really is about that journey of everybody finding what's home to them. And, and I do think the book is a series of portraits of people that we've painted and interpreted to have all found home in different ways. And I think that's the ultimate goal is that people find what's home to them. You know, it's not a universal answer. But I do think at its core, it's got to, you need that sort of connection with where you live. And I think that's really the root of it. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. the book is filled with those types of connections and that each one shows the individuality, that it's not a formula, that it's very, very nuanced. And so I think that's really great. 
that's incredible. And on that, I'd love to open up to questions from the audience. Uh, it sounds like, given the title and a lot of your work, you're staying in that sector. Uh, have you ever felt the tug for uh, public commissions or uh, any kind of tract homes or uh, imbuing your architectural style on multifamilies, multifamily homes? Yeah, it's interesting. So we've done some multifamily projects. Um, we've actually done two projects in the city for Giovanni Yoder Company. We've done two headquarters for them. It's good. It's a different pace. So, like in both those cases, we you know, create these different workspaces and different type of work environments. And I think about the day we installed the furniture, they said we've added 80 employees for Urban Cell. And the next headquarters, they were like, we've got a new building. We, it's just it's it's it didn't have a sense of permanence to it. Um, the multifamily we've done, it's been great. There's a developer friend of mine that I work with. Um, it, it, it's so um, sort of market budget driven a lot of times and you know for good or bad I think our houses tend to be the things people do when they make their wealth elsewhere and so it tends to be something that is more about the heart than the pocketbook which I think you know there's always a financial component to it but it's not the main and so I find in those other markets um, you know, we do them typically, we, we're just design architects, we'll have an architect of record. Um, personally, I just, I don't find them particularly satisfying, they're, they're hard to do. And in my mindset, is I'm much more comfortable designing a doorknob than I am a city block. And so I, I, I like, and I learned that early on working with large firms and smaller firms, that I, I like the intimacy. Um, and the scale has to stay small. And I, and I like the psychological component with the client. I like knowing who's living in the space versus kind of a generic, you know, here's the market we're trying to hit. Uh, I should probably look through the book, but have you done much work in Connecticut? We have not. But we're always looking. <laughs> <laughs> I could see your work really transforming the landscape of Connecticut too. Yeah. Well, and, well, and I will say the one thing with multi things that I found, well, Here's what I think about the thing that I found interesting, and we're sort of the victim of our own, you know, sort of vision is, is we did a 17 unit building, but it was important to me that every unit had something different. So somebody was like the fireplace unit, or the dining room unit, or the round one. And so we were the opposite of what I think most developers do, which is let's take a unit and repeat it 17 times for efficiency. I wanted everybody to have a different view. So you could say, well, have you seen my unit? Have you seen my unit? And so it became this almost like, you know, energy that we're not all the same. And and, and, and I thought if we ever did a skyscraper, like why do all four sides of skyscrapers all look the same? It doesn't make any sense. The sun doesn't do the same, the views aren't the same, the wind's not the same. So I've always thought, you know, why are you repeating these units? And so there's you know there's some thoughts out there that I think are interesting that apply. Um, so I, I, I digress. But well, I mean, if you go along the shoreline uh, of the Sound, it seems like Yale School of Architecture just grabbed the whole market. <laughs> <laughs> Why let them have it? Yeah. <laughs> Who else has a question? Yeah, so like obviously, you know, designing a home is just such like a collaborative process and like, you know, dealing with clients and like other, you know, stakeholders. Like, how do you feel like your ability to work on a team is kind of like transformed in the past 16 years? Yeah, there's a component of, of yourself as a creative person and how you work with people. And I do think you know, there are probably the, you know, frankly, rights of the world that say, I know how I want things to be and this is my vision. And, and I've just learned as a creative person, I like that collaboration. So I, I've just, as we've done houses, I've learned that I just I enjoy the connection with the client. And so really, back to the first question, why are we doing the book? It's because I don't want to get commissions because I share a locker next to you in the in the country club. You know, so if we can float these bottles, you know, nationally, which was only has such great exposure, those people that get us and then we get them, we can find each other. And that's really what it's about is 
spending that time with that person and you're both better for it. And that's that's really what beats me. And so I'm trying to put ourselves out there enough to say, here we are, if you can respond to us, let's let's talk. And that's you know, you know, it sounds like a sales coach, but that's generally what, what I enjoy. I enjoy those people. That, and some of our best jobs have been the ones in Chicago or we're doing a job in Vermont right now that they work really hard. My brilliant sales pitch is hire someone local if you can, but let us be your last choice. And so when somebody really has to work to find us, then that relationship's there because they want it. And that makes for a really good, um, a good connection with somebody. And then once you have that connection, everything just flows. So that's, I've just learned that over my 16 years. <laughs> find a good client. <laughs> Yeah, so, so with our firm, we, we do under the sort of the architecture umbrella any of the plumbing, tile, countertops. Um, and then we also have as a separate company, Decorative Interiors, and, and Bronwyn Ford, who's here as well, um, is the is our lead interior designer and person facing Ford. And, and some of that, is, again, is what we've learned over our 16 years. So I think early on, we leaned heavily into the architecture. And we thought that there's you know, a wall or a room you know, if we do great architecture, it's going to make for a great project. And we learned pretty early on how important the interior, decorative interior piece is. And so you know the best architecture in the world and without completing the vision, you can't even photograph it. I mean, and, uh, you know, and so a little bit was just through default of having a lot of early on great projects that, you know, and, and even to the to publication world, it's really decoratively fo focused. Yeah. It's really not focused on architecture, they would say, it's great architecture, but there's nothing you can do. So some of it was just self-preservation to be able to complete the picture. And I think, you know, to the point of relationships and clients, I think between Craig Dixon and the problem and Ford, they're people that just happen to sort of drift into my life that I have this connection with. We could finish, finish each other's sentences. You know, we, we sort of build a cohesive vision. And so, you know, I don't know if Robin asked, but she just did it. She started doing the decorative interiors <laughs> since at some point. We said, like, yes, we have a decorative interior division <laughs> now. And it's been, it's been great because it gives a place to come if you like the firm, you like the work, that you can get a complete vision. And, you know, but we also work with other interior designers. Robin works with other architects. But the goal is that it's always a good fit to complete the picture because I do think it makes a big difference. It's always so sad when architects send in projects to the magazine and the designer like, don't look at the design. Like, but when someone opens the magazine, they're going to see the design. Or they'll send the architecture before any of the interiors were installed. Yeah, I've kind of learned the hard way on that. <laughs> Once you get rejected enough, you, you, you recalibrate and approach it differently. And, and not that every project has to be, you know, in a magazine, because yeah. I do think, I mean, some projects, homeowners kind of cobble together their own interiors, and they do have a richness to them. And, and it's the thing I've enjoyed about the book, is I would say, you know, not every interior is, you know, a gallery magazine interior. I mean, it's, there's some that are, you know, a little more um, flea market chic, I would say, but it, but it still has this sort of soulful undertone to it. And, and, and there's an authenticity that that reflects the owner, I will struggle more with the owner that wants to live a certain way and buy certain things, but it doesn't really reflect them. And you're kind of like, do you really live here? Like, uh, like to me, that comes through too when you pitch a project. And somebody's like, this doesn't feel authentic. We're enforcing it. Yeah, yeah. So. Great. These are good questions. These are so much better than live or baked flowers. <laughs> but we will answer them. Oh, the first panel discussion was over yet. Nice, soulful discussion. And, and the first question was um, Do you prefer live or fake flowers in your interiors? So, and it wasn't, it wasn't other interior designers. And, and in case you're curious, the answer was live. live <laughs> that, that, that's what I'm called. So. I wonder what percentage of people would say that. It was a little bizarre. But, yeah. so, so these are great questions. Thank you, audience. Have we got time for one more question before? One 
chill, go over and then do it. Yeah, I think that's the serendipity of it all. So I feel like, you know, maybe to Jackie's chagrin and, and, um, and Kathleen's chagrin probably too. Like, I felt, I felt like as long as I could, so they pulled the manuscript out of my hand. I gave it everything I sort of knew to give it. And now I'm, I'm excited to see, like, you know, and I do obsess a little bit, but I look on Amazon and whether it be your bank seat or number one, and number two, new releases. And, He's not an architect. What's in this category at all? So, so I, I, I love to see what's going to happen. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that to me, that's the beauty of it. I feel like we did our part, and it's out in the world, and people may like it, they may hate it, but I felt like as a team, you know, and I give you know Jill so much credit, Kathleen so much credit, that you know, and Jackie so much credit, that you know, we did the best we can, and. We'll see. Hopefully, we sell some books, and hopefully, some good people come into our lives. And you know, I've, I've even the whole book talk is really just about meeting new people and enjoying this. I mean, because this is the good stuff. I mean, I, this is we all have struggles in our lives, and this is not a struggle. This is something we're choosing to do, and we're together, and we can have. You know, we're talking about architecture. I mean, yeah. you choose architecture, then you know. Well, I thought the last chapter that we added on was the one of the house in the West, actually. Um, yeah. Well, well, Jill and Julia, yeah, and this I, is the house. This well, and I get Joe credit for well, a lot of things, but two things in particular. One is that my house is even in the book, which has ended up being like one of the best things about between the book and the publication and the exposure. And that just was Jill coming by the house after me, and she's, this needs to be in the book. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> This is just my little thing I'm doing. Oh my gosh, this needs to be in the book. And then the other one was we were in the ninth hour and we did a project out west that was a little more you know, towards the modern side. Yeah, and so Jill's like, oh my gosh, you've got to move this forward and add more pages. And we sort of felt like, are we allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things you talked about, especially about what's coming later, that was a big uh, part of the book. Yeah. Because it was I mean, I'll, I'll give Joe credit. She, I mean, I really think he made the book great. And uh, it, it was, you know, sometimes Jill's comments can get to take them struck. And once you sort of brush yourself off, you go, know, she's right. <laughs> and, and, and you were right. It, it's made a big difference. And even the writing assignment, I think, was a great way, instead of writing the book, it was to approach it to say, what are you doing? And I think reframing that, I think those seeds are all throughout the book. But it wasn't written like a book. And I think that was a great way to think about, like, what are we doing? And that was the whole point of the sabbatical was to think about big picture stuff. And why are, you know, why are we here? And what are we trying to do with the work? And, you know, do I want to do shopping malls and buy the firms? And, and I kind of decided, no, I don't think I want world dominance. <laughs> you know, and that's, 
I like work for them. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a happy place. I'm like, what the heck? You know what I mean? Well, there's another question in the back. <laughs> Well, I mean, I would say probably like a lot of architects, we still have a little sort of PTSD from 2008, 2009. And so I think when initially when this, this sort of coronavirus hit and everything slowed down, you know, my first thought was, oh my gosh, we need to make sure we've got work to keep everybody busy. So we took on a lot of projects that we probably wouldn't normally take on, and we did have some projects get them on hold. And so then the projects that put on hold came back. The projects we committed to came due because they were all six months out. And then we had a flood of clients, really out west and in the mountains, just you know, just anything they could find. And they were buying things without even seeing it. And you know, and we have a you know a, a rule that firm that if you're a client, we're gonna do work for you. And um, so a lot of it's just been trying to, like everybody else, just catch a breath and I wonder about some of the trends. I mean, like the exodus out of you know, New York to go have dinner last night with some friends, and they were talking about the Hamptons being so popular. And I do wonder, you know, when the theaters open back up and the restaurants open back up, I mean, at some point, I think that's going to recalibrate. Like, I don't see this being forever, but I think, you know, if you're busy and working hard, and the idea of having six months to work remote and disconnect is kind of a nice thing, but I, I think it'll rebalance itself out and you know I, 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 I think you go where the work is and that's that's sort of the way I see it and but we are doing a lot of second home work which I enjoy and, and those markets are just flooded right now. So well this has been wonderful. Thank you for the excellent well, thanks for coming out on a Friday night. Yeah.